uh, how to be, be a part of the AI economy, a part of the creator economy, and benefit and increase national productivity. I think, uh, Minister uh, Ingabire, you've thought a lot about this. You've already taken some actions in your country, which has uh, got a good record on digital. Uh, can you tell us your perspective on how you can continue that success in thinking about extending it to AI? What's different about AI, or is it really a continuation of some things that you've been able to do successfully thus far? I would like to pick up from um, what Kristalina was talking about growth. Um, we have done um, a study to look at what would be the impact of AI in Rwanda. And what we're seeing is, and I think you talked about 0.8%, what we're seeing is even with basic use cases that we can deploy, we are seeing a potential to create at least 6% GDP contribution. And so we've been able to map out um, the different use cases. We talk about early warning um, you know, uh, systems for farmers. Uh, farmers make up the largest uh, percentage of our population, and you see that trend similar across the continent. Um, we're talking about public administration use cases, whether it's from uh, taxes or the social security claims, and really being more efficient with, with how we're using some of these tools. And to your point, Vijay, um, this is going definitely it's going to be a continuation of the already existing foundations that we've put in place um, in, 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 in our digital transformation efforts. It also means that we're going to have to think differently on how we continue to close the gap on some of the digital aspects. So it's uh, making sure that everyone uh, is connected. Today we have about 93% uh, population coverage, but we still have a gap on usage. And the usage gap is driven largely by digital skills, by access to affordable devices and affordable internet connectivity. But at the same time, we're also going to be Combining those efforts with energy access, Rwanda today has 81% household access to electricity. Mm -hmm. But when we start to look at what these AI use cases that we're going to put in place, we start to anticipate what the demand is going to look like. And that has called for different ways on how we, we, we leverage that. And so for Rwanda, we're building on these foundations that are already in place, but at the same time, asking ourselves the question, how do we not lag far too behind on this AI journey? And there has been some analysis that looks at um, the effects of individual countries that may have uh, one shortfall or another. It might be skills, it might be infrastructure, it might be uh, data collection. Um, and the, uh, the WEF actually put out an interesting report on this, on um, AI competitiveness through regional collaboration, uh, which I recommend to all of you. Uh, what do you see as the prospects or potential for regional collaboration? Mm -hmm. I know there are a lot of sensitivities at the national level. This is the age of national sovereignty. We see this among the big boys, as it were. And uh, is there opportunity for uh, emerging economies maybe to collaborate in order to step up that ladder? Absolutely, and we're already seeing that happen. Um, uh, last year, we worked with Singapore uh, to put in place a playbook for small states on how we can really you know, create a proper roadmap on how we uh, build the foundations for the AI economy. We are seeing this even within the Commonwealth member states, you know, creating that kind of coalition, which is very important. Now, I want to give you an example. Um, when you talk about regional collaboration, at the end of the day, Collaboration is very important for developing countries because it helps you to address the resource constraints that you already have. So whether it's from an energy perspective, whether it's from a re any other kind of resource compute, um, and even data. So we, we, we are seeing, um, at least on the African continent, through Smart Africa and different um, institutions, where we are now starting to work on frameworks that allow for cross-border data flow. And that's going to be very important, open data access in terms of making sure you have lots of data that you can train these models on. And I'll end on this one, uh, where regional collaboration comes into play very, in a very powerful way, is when we look at what our energy demand is going to be in terms of AI workloads, we cannot close you know, we cannot satisfy the demand in the short term. So right. we're already working with the East African community on an East African, you know, energy pool. So if there's excess capacity in any of the countries and one country has a sudden demand for, you know, for energy because of the AI workloads, then we're suddenly able to do well, that. It's promising to see these advances because, of course, historically, Africa has found it challenging to have trade across borders, right, or even have visa-free travel. This has been a real challenge. So to see some of these some of these yeah. bits of progress, and hopefully on the digital front, we could start off on a better footing. Absolutely. Now, I, I do believe we have a summit coming up in April to take, try to take on some of these issues, so people who are interested could follow up on that. Maybe Vijay, just wanted to weigh in because we keep referencing Africa on this panel. Um, a couple of things. Um, when you look at some of the efforts that are being put in place, it's really how do we come together? Mm -hmm. One, not just to aggregate demand, but also to have a single unified mm -hmm. strategy. 
Um, recently, we had the African Union put in place an AU AI continental strategy, mm -hmm. and that sort of like lays out the building blocks of what yep. we want to invest in. And I agree with what Brad was saying. One, the, the, one of the main areas is around skills. Yeah. How do we? Um, and earlier we were having a conversation. We <coughs> Africa has a growing youthful, digitally savvy population. <coughs> Uh, and to the point that you're making about being users or, or early adopters, Rwanda has seen that. We'd, we never created drones, but the way we use drones to deliver um, you know, medical products to rural areas, mm -hmm. and then that has been able to expand to different markets where, and even in doing that, we didn't only just use that use case, we were able to create regulations that now many countries are benchmarking right. and to create an ecosystem. Great. And so the last point I want to make is what we're seeing, and you did mention the summit that is happening in April 3rd and 4th. Again, the summit, it's the Global AI Summit on Africa. The idea is to bring, to have a collective voice, sure. to think together about what the priorities are in terms of adoption, what building blocks that we need to put in place to co-invest as, as countries, but also at the same time, creating those AI hotspots on the continent where we can test and experiment with these applications, but also allow for scale. And for that to happen, we'll need to have streamlined regulations and policies. And I must say, when I look at really what the future holds, there's really a lot of promise in how we are coming together as a continent to really drive AI adoption in an equitable manner. Well, this is, this is very promising.